Okay, so this is day 12 of the 2022 challenge by the sociology guy. Um, this week we're looking at culture and identity. For those of you who are new to the 2022 challenge, um, what I do is I set 20 marks worth of questions each morning and of an evening I um, post my answers both on my website, sociologyguy.com and here on YouTube through a walkthrough video of how I've answered the question. We've so far we've done um, 11 days. We've looked at um, research methods. We've also looked at education. We've looked at a little bit of the theory and debate side. This week we're looking at culture and identity. And this morning I set this question, or these two questions I should say, are, are worth 20 marks. First of all, outline and explain two ways globalization has shaped the formation of social class identities. And then the second question was an item question. Um, it was, Item A, sociologists argue we live in a consumer society and our patterns of consumption reveal a lot about who we are. Additionally, some argue that individuals gain status from the goods they consume. So the question that accompanies that item was, apply material from item A, analyze two ways in which consumption shapes individuals' identities. Through the day, what I do is I send out some little hints. So here I've looked at ways in which globalization might influence social class identity. Of course, when we're talking about social class identity, we can also talk, we can talk about working class, middle class, underclass, upper class, the elites. And um, we can talk about how globalization will impact on those. A few things that I've made this from, because this type of question where it's outlined and explained, it's asking you to link one section of the, of the course to another section of the course two things that aren't usually taught together. So when you do social class identity, you don't necessarily always talk about globalization, but we would talk about globalization when we talk about global culture. So how has global culture then had a knock on effect and influenced the different social classes? So first of all, globalization has um, influenced the cultural capital that is available to individuals, uh, particularly the middle class, they may be able to obtain more cultural capital because of the process of globalization, either through being able to travel to different places or through having access to more information and more cultural artifacts and cultural knowledge. Rise of nationalism within working class subcultures. And um, this has obviously been seen as a reaction to migration. Um, and sort of like lack of job opportunities that have come about. Uh, we've sadly, we've seen this sort of like in the UK um, with kind of a rise of sort of like, you know, xenophobic attitudes, um, you know, sort of like we're looking at things like Brexit and we look at uh, leaving the EU and sort of like migrant crises and sort of like how this has changed the way the working class perceive that. Of course, we've got to avoid stereotypes and say that not all working class people believe these things, but um, there were there were pockets of rise of nationalism within working class cultures, subcultures. Changing patterns of consumption as part of our social status. And um, so people will look to consume different goods that are influenced um, by global culture. Um, and that may reflect their social status, their social class status. The impact on employment of globalization of manufacturing. And um, we've looked at this with education, the impact particularly on working class boys of the deindustrialization of the UK as other industry, as industry moves to parts of the world where it's actually cheaper to produce manufactured goods. Greater ethnic diversity within social groups. One thing we need to, to address sort of like is that not all ethnic minority groups end up in the lower social classes. There is quite a spread throughout. Chinese and Indian students, um, some black African, black Caribbean students will end up, I keep saying students, I mean individuals, will end up in, in the higher social classes as we have certain amounts of social mobility. We also will have a more diverse working class um, in terms of ethnic grouping as well. Increased multiculturalism within the middle classes. Um, what we will see is the middle class culture being influenced to a greater extent by the people that they meet, by the places that they go, and growth of individualism within the middle class as well. So here's my answer to this first question. Um, I've picked out two ways. Um, one, I've focused on employment. And the reason I focused on employment here is because it may link in to your edu your work in education, where you look at sort of like one of the reasons why boys work, particularly working class boys, underachieve. It helps to kind of make those links between the different um, sections in sociology. So one way globalization has shaped the formation of social class identities is through changes to the way in which people are employed. One of the impacts of globalization has been the relocation of working class jobs in manufacturing to other areas of the world that have lower labor costs. 
as many working class communities in the UK were based around heavy manufacturing, such as coal mining and steelwork, this has had a negative impact on their identity. In yesterday's questions, we looked at how employment impacts on people's identity. Um, I could have developed that point as well. I've gone with a bit of research here by Charlesworth. Charlesworth found that closure of industry in South Yorkshire had led to the development of working class cultures that were centered around drinking and impersonal relationships, and that their identity was based on the economic limitations they faced as a result of the deprivation in the area. So what Charlesworth has found is sort of like is that now that they've moved a lot of the industry out and people are having to move to lower paid jobs or jobs that are less secure, this has had an impact. People are less focused on um, the community, more on individualism um, and more on pleasure seeking and leisure. And this has shaped the identity of that area. Furthermore, sociologists such as Mac and Gail have argued that de this deindustrialization has led to a crisis of masculinity. We've talked about this in education, which is a result of globalization and rapid changes to employment opportunities for working class males. Could have made that a little bit more explicit, I think. I uh, could have mentioned sort of like that, how this crisis of masculinity then impacts on working class males. But um, it, in one way, this is backing up the point that I've made is that globalization does impact on identity. A second way in which globalization has shaped the formation of social class identities is through consumption. This is particularly the case with middle class and upper working class workers who have higher levels of individualism than the traditional, than the traditional working class. The process of globalization has opened up new experiences to these social classes and they see discovering new experiences as part of their identity. I'm going to use a bit of research to back it up. So I've explained how globalization has had an impact on identity. Now I'm going to back it up. Uri argued that this has produced the tourist gaze as individuals look to more exotic places to discover and utilize their economic capital to purchase tailor-made experiences that provide them with unique experiences and provide them with status amongst their peers. This can be supported by Lawler, who argued that the middle class look to develop their tastes for higher culture and they achieve this through venturing to exotic locations and obtaining cultural knowledge from those countries, widening their cultural capital in the process. So I've used two studies here. One would be enough. The second one I'm talking about with Lawler, I'm using that to back up my point, to, to kind of thicken out my analysis, if you like. Our second question was on consumption and identity. And there's a few bits of research um, that link into the idea of consumption and identity. Of course, consumption, you can't kind of address that without looking at ideas of Marxism and capitalism. Um, we've got here Featherstone talking about shopping as a form of identity formation. Uri, which we mentioned in the first question, and you see sort of like the kind of synoptic nature of culture and identity where we've just used that to answer a question on social class identity, and now we're using it to talk about, um, um, now we're using it to talk about consumption. Str um, we talked about the tourist gaze. Stranati, media responsible for providing images of consumption that we imitate in forming identities. Um, if you're doing the media section, you will have done Stranati quite a bit, talking about the process of media saturation. Rojek, who we mentioned a couple of days ago as well, leisure and consumption of goods creates aspects of our identity. And we talked about Rojek when we were talking about employment and how employment gives us the means through which to consume and therefore it forms part of our identity. And then we've got Bauman, um, Zygmunt Bauman, who talks about the illusion of choice. Um, individuals will believe that they can change by consuming goods. They believe that by watching television and seeing these programs where people get makeovers, that they can do that. They can change their identity. However, in reality, their economic limitations mean that they can't. And then Clark and Critcher, um, very much a Marxist viewpoint, very critical viewpoint. Leisure is controlled through capitalism. And so what we perceive as being our identity is manipulated by the capitalist uh, society. So for example, we can say that um, going to the gym, we might think that we're doing this as part of our identity, but capitalism has manipulated us because it wants strong workers, it wants healthy workers. Likewise, things like yoga, um, that would be the same as well. So like they want people who are mentally resilient, um, lots of mental health um, as well and, and well-being apps are sort of like developed and Clark and Critcher would say, well, that actually serves the needs of capitalism. Of course, we can quite easily uh, criticize that and say, well, actually, individuals do get a lot of benefit from these things. But let's look at my response to this question. 
So with the 10 marker question, before we look at my response, we have to highlight the hooks. Remember, we have to look at them and we have to draw our information from the hooks that are here. The hooks in these items are getting more and more vague. So you have to be, you can pretty much draw lots of different um, viewpoints out of them. This one says sociologists argue we live in a consumer society. So that might be one hook. And that our patterns of consumption, potentially another hook, reveal a lot about who we are. Okay, this is linking to identity. Additionally, some argue that individuals gain status. We've mentioned status a couple of times. Um, from the goods that they consume. So apply material from item A, analyze two ways in which consumption shapes individuals' identities. Now I've highlighted those three hooks there. There's a few other things that we can talk about. I've talked about status symbols. We could also bring in a bit of late modernity and the work of Anthony Giddens, particularly around identity. Now, if you've done, well, you wouldn't have done families if you're doing culture and identity, but the idea of Giddens talking about re reflexivity is the idea that we start to perceive ourselves as personal projects. And so we consume goods in order to fulfill that personal project. You could develop that point. Leisure and consumption of goods, we've mentioned shopping as a form of identity formation. We just mentioned that with Featherstone and also Rojak. And capitalism and control of consumer society. Well, that is Clark and Critcher. Let's look at my responses. Apply material from item A, analyze two ways in which consumption shapes individuals' identities. Well, I've gone with the two ways here. One way in which consumption shapes individuals' identities is through gaining status. Postmodernists argue that we live in a media saturated society, and this allows individuals to form their own identity from the images and messages that they are bombarded with. Stranati argues that this media saturation has led to the development of a celebrity culture through which people look to imitate those with high status. This is achieved through consumption, often of goods advertised by celebrities or influencers, with the illusion that purchasing the good will allow the individual to change their identity to one similar to the celebrity selling the goods. However, Bauman argues that this is merely an illusion and that identity is not changed through consumption as many are unable to afford the goods. Again, I like to put in a bit of evaluation. The mark scheme um, doesn't look for evaluation, it looks for analysis in this type of question. However, what you it will say analysis and or evaluation and what you can do is evaluation can be presented as a form of analysis. I do always teach my students to continually evaluate, to continually make critical points, because then they're in a good habit of doing that when they get to a 20 or a 30 mark essay. So don't be too concerned if you have evaluated in as long as you have analysed your point and explained how it causes, um, how A causes B, then what you will do, you'll be credited for that. And any kind of evaluation of that doesn't take away, it only adds. So don't worry too much about the idea of analysis and or evaluation in these questions. Look specifically and um, write your paragraph, write a good paragraph, write a well-rounded paragraph, and then you will be in those top mark bands. A second way in which consumption can shape individuals' identities is through living in a consumer society. Clark and Critcher argue that individuals' identities are often formed through leisure, but that this is controlled by capitalism. They argue that in order to maximise profits, capitalists limit leisure choices available to individuals, to those that are the most profitable for businesses. As a result, individuals are not able to freely choose their leisure activities, and this limits the formation of their identity. Furthermore, they argue that leisure activities are often a smokescreen, presenting an ideology that benefits capitalism more than individuals. Leisure, particularly sporting participation, provides positive benefits for capitalism as workers feel less frustrated after leisure activities, while engaging in health and fitness produces more effective and efficient workers. For example, workplaces offering wellness services such as yoga classes to reduce stress rather than deal with structural inequalities created by capitalism. An evaluation here, you could cross this out. It's not gonna lose any marks if you put it in. I've just ended it off this way because I'm in the habit of doing that. However, critics would argue that this also provides benefits to the individual. One point I've not made here is I've obviously referenced the item in both of these. As you can see here, top line, item A, consumer society. And in the first one, gaining status, item A. We do that to signpost to the examiner that we have used the item. Right. It's important to do so 
Some people say you don't need to do it, that you're going to do it implicitly. I say don't take the chance. Make sure you do it. That sums up day 12. We're now on to day 13's questions. Um, and the questions again are still on culture and identity. Another two days of cult, uh, another three days of culture and identity actually. Um, outline and explain two ways subcultures are shaped by an individual social class. Now, lots of assumptions that are made that sort of like subcultures are a lower class phenomenon. They're not. We can have upper class, we can have middle class subcultures. Remembering that a subculture is a group that has its own norms and values that are different from mainstream society. Second question, apply an item material from item A, analyze two explanations for the formation of identity. If you look at the item here, it says different sociological perspectives argue over how identity is formed. While some suggest that structural factors shape our identity, others argue that identity is socially constructed based upon our understanding of society. Couple of things that will stand out here, structural factors. So we're starting to think about structural theories. We're starting to think about things like class, gender, ethnicity, and socially constructed socially constructed wherever you see that that should kind of ring a little bell of interactionism um, and the idea that um, everything in our society is constructed based upon the agreement between individuals about what something means so symbols um symbols and signs and things like that they're all socially constructed that sums up uh, day 12 and there's day 13's questions Hopefully I'll see you again um, tomorrow for um, my responses. Thanks for watching.